a seminar, a high energy seminar this week. And today we are happy to have uh, two speakers. And the first uh, speaker is uh, Julia uh, Miliari. And uh, Dr. Miliari has uh, her PhD at uh, SISSA uh, in Italy in 2010. And uh, with thesis entitled with uh, high energy emission in relativistic jets of uh, AGNs and the supervised, supervised by uh, uh, Dr. Salotti. And uh, she has uh, done her postdoc for four years at CFA here, supervised by Anita. And then she, uh, following that, she went to uh, CEA in France and uh, then back to Italy in 2018 at the Institute of uh, Radio Astronomy uh, in Bologna as a staff researcher. And uh, after 2020, uh, she uh, works on, uh, she's, uh, 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 she works on the jet physics from stellar uh, black hole to supermassive black hole, evolution of radio galaxies and uh, transients. And today, Celia uh, uh, will tell us with the particle acceleration and the uh, radiative process in hot spots of radio uh, galaxies and the floor is here. Thank you. So thank you for giving the opportunity to talk here. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here after uh, two or three years and uh, to, uh, to see known and new faces. Um, today I will discuss some uh, results that we obtain uh, in uh, two uh, in two uh, papers that we recently published, uh, it's, um, uh, uh, it's a study that I, one is a study that I led, the other was led by Monica Orienti and uh, with the help of uh, collaborators that you see listed here. So um, uh, radio galaxies can be uh, classified based on, on their... Okay. on their radio uh, power and morphologies. Uh, today, we are going to focus on the most powerful one, the faranoff Riley uh, Type II, which are characterized by uh, collimated jets ending in, uh, with uh, characteristic bright uh, radio hotspots. Uh, hotspots... <laughs> Hotspots can be uh, considered as the working surface of the, the jets. Uh, they are the uh, sites where uh, um, uh, particle acceleration is taking uh, place. This is a simple uh, uh, scheme of uh, uh, the um, uh, standard pictures where uh, um, particles uh, um, in the jets are accelerated in the reverse shock and then back flows in the um, uh, lobes typically. And on the right, uh, there is a, a X-ray Chandra image of, um, of Cygnus A radio galaxies. Um, where you can see the uh, luminous X-ray um, uh, hotspot to the right, uh, to the right and to the left. Uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, hotspots um, are typically observed in radio, but they emit up to uh, X-rays. And if you look at the um, uh, down at the spectral um, uh, energy distribution, uh, you see that this can be modeled with um, a synchrotron mechanism from radio to optical. And uh, uh, the X-rays uh, in this work by Staver and collaborator were reproduced uh, via synchrotron self-compton um, under the condition of energy equipartition between uh, particles and the magnetic field. So this is a simple picture, but uh, of course um, uh, it is challenged when we extend our study to uh, low power hotspots. So uh, on the left, uh, you see um, uh, the plot of uh, um, radio uh, luminosity versus X-ray uh, luminosity. Uh, the X-ray luminosity uh, is instead uh, is in fact the ratio between the observed one and the expected in case of a synchrotron self compton emission under the um, uh, assumption of equipartition. And one can see that while it works well for the most luminous sources on the um, uh, down the bottom uh, right, the um, uh, um, low power, uh, uh, low luminous, uh, uh, radio luminous uh, hotspots. Um, uh, uh, are uh, over luminous with respect to uh, the synchrotron self-compton. Um, uh, so 
one uh, would need a strong departure um, from equipartition to model their um, uh, X-ray luminosity. Then there is a second uh, point, uh, and uh, is the fact that when we use a high angular resolution Chandra uh, observation, the peak of the X-ray and the radio um, uh, um, emission are typically uh, are very often offset with the um, X-rays being downstream with respect to the um, uh, radio. And finally, uh, there has been detection of uh, extended uh, synchrotron optical emission and um, uh, this is a challenge in terms of um, uh, uh, the um, uh, simple picture of a single uh, strong shock where particle gets reaccelerated because the lifetime of the um, electrons that are producing the optical uh, emission are relatively uh, short and cannot explain uh, the length of the extended uh, um, structure that are observed also in uh, optical. So um, uh, the uh, two main questions that we were trying to address uh, are what is the um, uh, origin of the X-ray emission and uh, uh, what is the structure where particles get accelerated? Is there a, only a simple uh, uh, single uh, uh, shock front or a um, uh, uh, more complex structure? There have been uh, several studies that I listed here. Um, in our uh, um, work, what we, uh, our approach, uh, approach was to um, uh, try to uh, characterize the um, extended optical component using VL, uh, VLT um, observation, uh, so the near infrared and optical uh, emission of the hotspots. Then we use JVLA uh, high angular resolution uh, observa uh, observation to try to probe the uh, small scale structure of the hotspot. And then uh, um, uh, the, um, by uh, modeling the spectral energy distribution of the um, uh, hotspots, we are trying to test uh, what are the current uh, X-ray radiative processes proposed for um, uh, um, for these uh, targets. Um, now here I will focus in particular on two targets that uh, will address both uh, the, uh, the first and the second question. So we start with the first question, the origin of the uh, X-rays. And uh, for this one, um, uh, we consider the case of three of the Western hotspots in the radio galaxy uh, 3C227. Uh, on the left, uh, it, uh, uh, you can see the X-ray Chandra image of the galaxy that is uh, um, uh, with um, uh, radio contours. Uh, it's extended on 100 kiloparsec and uh, razor symmetric. To the right, there is the um, uh, zoom on the uh, X-ray and uh, uh, radio X-ray image and radio uh, contours. And immediately you can see that uh, uh, it is a case where we have uh, um, offset between radio and uh, the, the radio and the X-ray centroid of the, of the mission. This, of course, was already reported uh, by a previous study, and, a study um, and the offset is of the order of uh, one kiloparsec in projective size. So it could be even uh, larger. Um, our VLT observation uh, revealed, uh, unveiled also the optical uh, emission that uh, is shown here. The image is a bit noisy. However, the emission is uh, significantly detected and seems to um, uh, resemble the, um, uh, the structure that is seen also in uh, uh, X-ray and radio, sort of double arc shape um, uh, um, structure. Uh, then uh, when we go to um, uh, the JVLA um, observation at 22 gigahertz, we can probe the inner uh, structure of the uh, radio hotspot. So here again, uh, the image is the Chandra uh, one, and uh, over in POSA, we see the 22 gigahertz um, in, uh, contours in, in terms of intensity uh, map. Uh, and what you see is that, uh, again, we see a double arch structure with the second uh, arch that is marginally consistent with the position of the, uh, uh, the X-rays. And uh, uh, here below, there is the uh, zoom on the intensity map. The, but the, the interesting uh, finding when uh, uh, looking at, uh, at this uh, JBLA uh, maps was that we were able also to um, uh, constrain the presence of uh, a clumpy region 
which uh, makes up for about 10% of the total uh, emission, observed emission, uh, that are uh, unresolved and uh, uh, for which we constrain a linear uh, size dimension up to 100 parsec, and uh, which uh, appears to be characterized by a highly ordered magnetic field with a, a polarization fraction that are up to 60%. When we consider the uh, full structure, the polarization fraction, uh, fraction um, uh, decrease, meaning that probably uh, these clumps are embedded in a region where uh, there is a, a more a random field uh, uh, structure, possibly due uh, to uh, turbulence um, uh, in the, um, uh, um, related to uh, the plasma backflowing uh, um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the region. So uh, if we try to put together uh, these uh, uh, results, uh, to explain the um, origin of the X-ray emission, uh, the first uh, uh, point, which was already pointed out, uh, pointed out previously, is that one's own um, uh, radiative models fails, or uh, anyway, they are a bit in tension with the um, uh, um, observation uh, because of the offset, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms, uh, if we consider inverse Compton on CMB photons, that is the alternative uh, um, uh, uh, process uh, with respect to synchrotron self Compton, uh, this requires relatively high bulk motion and low um, uh, uh, viewing angles. And the low viewing angles are a bit uh, in tension with the symmetric structure that we see um, uh, in the large scale uh, map of the radio galaxy. So the alternative model is the um, uh, synchro um, uh, synchrotron origin also for the um, uh, uh, X-ray emission. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, the idea is that this synchrotron uh, uh, emission is produced by a second population uh, of electron. Of electrons. So um, uh, this is a model that was already um, uh, proposed also for uh, uh, explaining the X-ray emission in jet knots. And uh, uh, let's say the the um, the addition here in this study is uh, uh, related to the fact that we have uh, some observational justification uh, to, um, uh, uh, to this scenario. Uh, so in our uh, um, SCD, what we are assuming is that radio to uh, near infrared optical uh, emission is produced in the kiloparsec uh, scale structure, which is possibly um, associated with the older structure uh, of the um, uh, hotspot, the older shocks. While instead the X-rays are producing these clumpy, um, highly polarized uh, regions, um, which possibly marks uh, the region where uh, particle acceleration is taking uh, um, uh, um, uh, is happening in. Um, which is, let's say, uh, tracing the most recent episode of particle acceleration in the, um, um, in the hotspot. And this is due to the fact that um, the um, uh, um, Lorentz factor of the um, electrons that are producing the X-ray emission is relatively high. I mean, 10 to the 7, 10 to the uh, 8 uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, Lorentz factor, which translate in a short um, uh, radiative, life, uh, radiative lifetimes of this um, uh, uh, of these electrons, 100 years. So meaning that we expect these uh, sources to um, uh, quickly, um, uh, this, um, uh, uh, the, these electrons to quickly uh, fade. So the idea is that uh, um, in, uh, in gray, this is the emission, of, uh, the synchrotron emission of a single clamp, clamp and uh, we estimated that uh, about 20 uh, compact region could make up for the observer um, uh, to the obs uh, for the observer total uh, X-ray emission, and this under the condition of equipartition, also um, energy equipartition, uh, also in, inside the um, uh, inside the um, uh, uh, clamp uh, clampy region. So. Um, 3C227 is not the only target where uh, we observe similar uh, clumpy structure and for which, in fact, uh, has been pro um, uh, such a scenario has been proposed. One uh, famous example is Pictor A. Uh, once again, uh, here, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the radio observation uh, constrain a uh, dimension of the compact region up to a uh, few tens parsecs. And uh, there were also um, uh, uh, new star uh, observation that were supporting the um, uh, idea of synchrotron emission for the um, uh, X-rays. Um, uh, 
Uh, one criticism to this model is that uh, we need a high Lorentz uh, factor of the particles. Um, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, the second criticism really is related to the existence of this uh, uh, second population of electrons. However, recently we have been, um, uh, um, there have been advances in terms of uh, radiative MHD simulations. And here I'm showing an example by um, a group uh, uh, led by Dipanja Mukherjee, which, uh, which shows that uh, jets that are prone to MHD instabilities, such as kink instabilities or Kevin Helmut's instabilities, um, can develop complex uh, shock structures at the jet termination. And uh, uh, the um, uh, particles that are uh, accelerated in this kind of structure uh, may reach uh, uh, the required uh, uh, Lorentz factor depending on the number of uh, uh, crossing, uh, shock crossing that they undergo. Uh, so here to the right, there is uh, an example of uh, one of these uh, uh, simulated jets where you can see that we go even beyond uh, what we need to, uh, to produce the, um, um, the particles for the X-rays. So now I move to the uh, uh, next um, uh, case where uh, we wanted to address the question whether there is only one um, uh, shock front where particles get accelerated or the situation is instead more complicated. Here, um, uh, the, the main point is then uh, to, to look for um, uh, extended uh, infrared and optical uh, emission. Uh, this is 3C105. Uh, uh, on the left is the uh, uh, full uh, radio galaxies, and we will focus on the southern hotspot. Uh, a previous uh, work uh, um, uh, already identified the um, uh, uh, optical, uh, uh, the compact, uh, uh, the two compact uh, uh, sources, hotspots, the primary and secondary, which are detected in radio, X-ray, and uh, uh, optical. However, the new observation um, allowed to um, uh, also unveil the presence of uh, extended emission, which is in this uh, um, image a bit uh, uh, noisy again, but maybe in this one, you can see better on the left uh, um, what I mean. Uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, the compact region are the site where we have these uh, uh, shock fronts. And uh, uh, the um, diffuse emission should uh, uh, represent the post-shock uh, region. And uh, the um, optical um, observ the VLT observation allowed to place a um, uh, um, constraint on the um, uh, uh, size, on the dimension of this post-shock uh, post uh, region, which in projected um, uh, uh, terms is up to um, uh, four kiloparsec. So, <laughs> and, uh, so um, what uh, we did was, uh, um, and the extended emission is instead not modeled in uh, X-rays, uh, not uh, detected in uh, X-rays. So here to the right, uh, what we did was to model the um, uh, uh, spectral energy distribution of only the extended uh, uh, component. So you see that there is an upper limit for the uh, X-rays and uh, instead synchrotron emission is uh, um, uh, used to uh, model uh, the radio to infrared. Uh, this modeling allows to, uh, to put some constraints on the um, uh, particle, uh, um, particle distribution um, uh, in terms of maximum uh, Lorentz factor. And the Loren uh, maximum Lorentz factor translates in the radiative uh, um, uh, um, in the radiative lifetime of these particles, and then in the allowed scale in uh, um, size that they can uh, um, uh, they, they can cover. And you can see that there is uh, somehow uh, a tension between uh, uh, what we expect uh, uh, from the radiative lifetimes of the particles uh, with what we um, uh, we observe. Um, uh, then uh, uh, there are also a couple of other um, uh, constraints that we can use, um, uh, we can place, uh, assuming that uh, uh, we do not observe, since we do not observe X-ray um, uh, um, uh, emission, we can place 
uh, a lower limit to the magnetic field uh, in, uh, um, in, this, um, uh, in this region, which is fully in agreement uh, with uh, the expectation in terms of uh, equipartition magnetic field. And also uh, another um, uh, constraint is related to the gamma break, the minimum gamma break allowed by uh, the radio to optically infrared uh, SCD. So if um, uh, um, uh, so um, uh, the, the detection of this extended region um, uh, um, can be explained uh, explain in terms of two pos uh, possible scenarios. Either these uh, electrons are like streaming uh, along the, the, um, the magnetic field lines once they, they have been accelerated um, uh, in the shock front. Uh, and this assumes uh, the presence of a relatively ordered magnetic field, or um, in order to explain the, the, uh, the sites that we are observe, uh, observing, they, uh, they must undergo uh, some uh, kind of reacceleration process after uh, uh, the forced acceleration in the shock front. Um, uh, the, um, the observational constraint, um, so we can put some observational constraints on the first uh, scenario, the idea of, um, uh, um, uh, of diffusion after the shock front. And these uh, are um, uh, um, related to the fact that uh, if we put, uh, if we assume this uh, diffusion uh, um, scenario, the particles, of course, they, they are not anymore accelerated once they have left the front shock. And this means that the gamma break that we observe in the SED of the extended emission must be at least uh, must be, um, uh, it cannot be uh, lower, no, cannot be um, uh, greater than um, uh, the um, uh, gamma break that uh, was constrained for the compact uh, uh, region. Then the second is related to uh, the fact that uh, the diffusion, uh, diffusion time of the, um, uh, of the particles must be uh, shorter than their synchrotron cooling time, of course, because we are still seeing them. Um, and, uh, and finally, okay, there is a, a loose constraint on, uh, uh, on the minimum magnetic field. So if we put together these uh, three requirements, we, um, uh, uh, we can uh, obtain a uh, um, uh, um, constraint on uh, the, al um, the allowed va values in terms of magnetic field and mean free pass of the particles in the post-shock region. So it's a bit of a complicated... Um, uh, uh, plot in this case, but uh, um, uh, what, what is important to see is that they allow the uh, um, uh, uh, region uh, in, the, in this parameter space is uh, relatively narrow. Um, uh, in principle, uh, uh, it, this is not fully excluding the, um, uh, the diffusion scenario, but is making it uh, uh, relatively fine-tuned. Suggesting that uh, uh, it is highly uh, likely that instead there is some efficient uh, acceleration mechanism that is uh, acting after uh, um, in the post-shock uh, post region, which uh, is able uh, to re-energize re particle at least up to um, gamma or Lorentz factor of the, um, of the order of 10 to the 6, because we are seeing the, uh, the optical infrared region. Uh, one, uh, one possibility is that uh, uh, this, um, uh, uh, this mechanism is related to the presence of uh, turbulence, and so there is some sort of stochastic uh, uh, Fermi uh, two-type uh, um, uh, mechanism that is uh, um, uh, acting in this, uh, uh, in this region. So my time is running up. Uh, I'm, uh, what I want to, uh, to say, I mean, uh, the, the main results is that for the first time, uh, uh, we can uh, um, obser uh, give observational grounds to um, uh, models that have been proposed uh, very long and that somehow uh, remained um, unconstrained or unjustified. And uh, uh, to do this, um, it is very important uh, to have uh, um, uh, a multi-wavelength coverage. Uh, and in particular, to, um, it was uh, uh, really useful to probe them, uh, to probe the uh, uh, structure of the, the inner structure of the hotspots um, uh, and uh, um, uh, to have high sensitivity uh, optical observation. And the, uh, another step is also, as uh, was done also for Pictor A, to go and look for X-ray observation on uh, uh, after uh, 10, uh, uh, 
10, 15 years uh, from the first observation uh, to look for the presence of uh, um, uh, X-ray variability that is expected uh, is one of the prediction of this uh, uh, double synchrotron uh, scenario. I close and I just make some uh, advertising for our Bologna VBI conference that we are um, uh, organizing uh, uh, this May. So come to visit us. Uh, what role does pre existing structure in the intergalactic medium play in the development of these clocks? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I don't know because uh, I would say that um, um, what we are seeing is not interacting exactly with inter uh, intergalactic medium. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the region that we are observing is somehow the interaction of determination with the jet itself. Um, then on the... Um, uh, on the role of the intergalactic medium on the formation in general of the shocks. This is another point. Uh, and uh, uh, it's true that uh, dense or uh, less dense environment can probably change the, um, uh, the structure of the shocks. But um, it, it is an interesting point and probably uh, we need, uh, and this is another point, we need a larger uh, sample to see if there is a difference between low power and high power sources uh, in terms of inner structure and in terms of what are the environment where they, they are located. These were not in a glass, for example. Do we have a further question? Um, well, X rays ideally at least uh, comparable with the uh, JVLA, but already so it would be, I mean, Chandra is already good in terms of um, uh, in terms of angular resolution. Our problem is the exposure time that are needed to get uh, um, uh, significant uh, to to probe significant in a significant way the um, the change uh, in the in terms of fluxes. So, of course, we are dreaming about uh, this news and uh, integral field spectroscopy, but <laughs> we will be. So you talk mostly about the low luminosity. Uh, Objects. So, uh, about the higher luminosity, can you say if, uh, if there is any evidence? Uh, uh, what is the Mach number of those? Uh, 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 because this could be related on uh, what is the amount of uh, clumps uh, or the lower density of the clumps. So, yes, uh, one point is that right now the, the observation were. Uh, sort of bias because we are looking to low power sources because are the one that uh, were uh, problematic in terms of uh, modeling. And now the, the second step is instead, in fact, to, to go and probe the, the structures of low and high power to see if the presence or not of these uh, clumps are in fact re really related uh, to, um, um, to the uh, for uh, to the production of uh, X-ray, so in this sense, uh, it's clear that uh, the 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 scenario is a bit biased right now. Uh, in terms of Mach number, uh, this is a good question because uh, I think for picture A there was some study that uh, was mentioned uh, was uh, constrained, but picture A is still uh, uh, again a low power uh, uh, source. For Cygnus A, I don't know if there is uh, any study that. Mm, as please some constraint on the Mach numbers. Because the Mach number could be related on uh, how intense is the magnetic field which should be generated downstream of the shock yeah. because of the clouds. So that's why I was asking. The Mach numbers are usually slow here, right? So yes, like, yes, so like three or so, something, three, yeah, five, I think, for a picture. Yeah, yeah, for a picture, I think uh, okay. it was like below five for sure. Also. For, I think you said there were new star observations, so yeah, appreciate you. No, this was a picture A. It's, I think, the only one that has been observed as far. Uh, and um, 
and it's clear because it's also the the brightest one and uh, one of the nearest and uh, so uh, the, there is a study uh, led by uh, Sunada uh, collaborators where they claim that um, there is um, an indication for um, curvature of the spectrum, which is what you expect in case of a um, synchrotron. Of course, uh, given the short time scale, uh, um, radiative lifetime of these particles, you expect that they cut out, uh, cut off, uh, um, at like uh, tens of uh, uh, kV. But I think they still need uh, um, deeper observation to be strongly constraining. It'd be nice to see what the SCV looks like on this one. Yes, yes, you're right. I mean, I could have. Well, I that steeper than the yeah, there, there is. I mean, the reference is this. Actually, I, I could have included also this uh, the, the image of the right? Yeah, to me, in terms of error bars, are they are still both compatible. <laughs> but I know that they were deeper observations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we, uh, we are going to move to the next speaker. And if you have further questions, you can. Ah, yes, I indicated the, the, the room on 306 tape. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, back into the beginning, <laughs> given away my, my talk there. <laughs> so, uh, our next speaker today is uh, Corey Fletcher. So, uh, Dr. Fletcher completed her bachelor degree in physics at the University of Missouri in 2011, uh, studying dust around uh, giant branch stars. And she then moved to Germany to complete her master's in astrophysics at the University of Bonn, Germany, and uh, the Max Planck uh, Institute for Radio Astronomy. Uh, here, she studied uh, high mass star form uh, formation using radio wavelengths. Following her master's degree, uh, she moved to Florida to continue her PhD in space science in Florida Institute of Technology. For her PhD, she jumped to uh, the other side of the spectrum and the study that actuates from magnetic fields in massive stars. She recently joined the Fermi G GBM team in Alabama to study gamma ray uh, burst and uh, gravitational wave counterparts. She is currently involved in var uh, various future gamma ray missions and concept uh, studies such as Moonbeam, which uh, Dr. Fletcher will talk about today, and uh, Starburst and uh, Globa. And so the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. Let's see if I can put that a little better. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming today in person and online. And thank you for having me to discuss um, our current uh, mission concept that is in the works. And that is Moonbeam. So Moonbeam is being developed down in Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, at Marshall Space Flight Center in conjunction with Lockheed Martin. And I'm gonna just kind of give a, an overview of it today and kind of our science goals and, and um, everything that we're working to do. And um, I'm gonna be around after. So please, if you have more questions or wanna chat with me later today, please let me know. Um, so Moonbeam is a gamma ray instrument that we are wanting to put up in cis lunar orbit. Our science goals are to explore the behavior of matter and energy under the extreme conditions um, by observing relativistic astrophysical explosions. Uh, we're playing on a three-year gamma ray mission, which will provide time for a bunch of different observations of binary compact mergers, core collapse supernovae, magnetar giant flares, um, and just a lot of different observations. One of the distinct um, 
differences of the moonbeam than the current, you know, or uh, spacecraft up there to observe gamma rays is that we want to be in cis lunar orbit. So this would put us out at a distance that we can see the entire sky all the time. Um, we won't have the Earth blocking any of it. We'll be able to have uninterrupted, uninterrupted observations with a duty cycle greater than 96%. And I will have nice, um, stable background radiation, which is good for gamma ray observations. Uh, the the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey pointed out that it was important to have higher sensitivity, sensitivity all sky monitoring of the high energy sky. And we believe our instrument fits in perfectly with that, um, that idea. And spoiler alert, Moonbeam is currently in a phase A study, which means we were accepted for by a NASA mission of opportunity last summer. And we are currently working on providing a review of our instrument to be looked at in this summer. And they're going to decide whether we can move on with our, set, our, our concept or have to reapply. So it's been a very busy year for us, but exciting. So a little bit about the main uh, science goal of Moonbeam is gamma ray bursts. And so gamma ray bursts are most energetic explosions in the universe. They're multi-wavelengths, so they're detected from radio all the way up to gamma rays. They're multi-messenger, they can be detected with gravitational waves and neutrinos and cosmic rays, and they're very transient in nature. So we have gamma ray bursts lasting from milliseconds to hundred seconds. We have um, afterglow starting within minutes and then can last up to years. And they're usually detectable about once per day and they're all over the sky. So here is our um, kind of sky map of about 400 GRBs that have been seen all over the sky with GBM. The last uh, GRB seen there is a GRB 17817, which I'll discuss a little bit here in, in a minute. So what exactly are gamma ray bursts and where do they come from? So here we have kind of a distribution of number of GRBs um, split up by their duration, so how long they lasted. And when you look at this, you see a bimodal distribution of short and long GRBs. And it's been long thought that the short and long GRBs come from different progenitors. So here's the two different scenarios on the right of long gamma ray bursts coming from core clap supernovae. And then short gamma ray bursts are thought to come from compact binary systems merging, such as binary neutron stars or neutron star binary or black holes mergers. So that, that's um, kind of the schematic of gamma ray bursts. But with the onset of gravitational wave detections through LIGO and Virgo, we have been able to have a lot more information about where these short gamma ray bursts would be coming from. So gravitational wave, so basically using gravitational waves and EM um, observations gives us a lot of information about these short GRBs. We have a, just another little schematic of the creation of the, the jet and the GRB and then the kilonova and afterglow here on the left. Um, and so when we see a, a binary neutron star merger and gravitational waves, we can really get a lot of information about the binary system parameters, you know, the masses. Is it two neutron stars? Is it a black hole or a neutron star? We can get a lot of information about the or about um, the distance. We can also do you know the spin of the system. We can get a precise merger time. So it provides a lot of information that we don't necessarily get from the EM observations. But the EM observations also provide kind of a detection confidence to that gravitational wave um, observation, saying yes, this is something that is astrophysical in origin. We can get the EM energetics. And then we also see X-ray and optical afterglows, which gives a precise, precise location. And also a redshift will provide a host galaxy. So we know a lot of information about these systems now just using the two different messengers here. And this was really put to test um, with GW17817 and GRB17817A, which was the first and so far only uh, joint detection of a binary neutron star merger in EM and gravitational waves. So here's just the little uh, video, if I can get it to play, of that observation. <laughs> so um, here we can see the LIGO chirp um, strain there down 
and see it's a detection. And then two minutes later, or two seconds later, sorry, we see Fermi GVM's detection of GRB 7217. And this event was huge. I mean, I'm sure you all have heard about it. Um, and so this is great for proving that binary neutron stars are a progenitor of short gamma ray bursts. The only problem is, is we've only had one and you really can't do too much with just one um, data point. So we're really hoping for more to come. And we do have the next observing run coming up here in May. So fingers crossed we get more joint detections. Um, but recently we also decided or discovered that uh, magnetar giant flares can actually present themselves as short gamma ray bursts in GBM data. So this um, is just kind of a little video about, okay, so this is a giant magnetar flare, or magnet, magnet, magnetar giant flare in our own system, in a, our own galaxy. And if we move it to extra galactic distances, we actually see that it looks like a short gamma ray burst. So that's interesting. And it has only recently been discovered. And um, the detection paper is Roberts all 2021, if you want to take a look. And Burns et al. 2021 actually went back and looked through a bunch of GBM data to see, are there other giant flares that are presenting themselves as uh, short gamma ray bursts? And he did end up finding a few that showed similar properties. So that's also something that we would like to look into more. So that brings us to Moonbeam's mission objectives. And the first one is to characterize the progenitors of GRBs and their multi-messenger and multi-wavelength multi sing signals. <laughs> and so here, again, is really the difference. Like, we really want to try and figure out, um, you know, which ones are the giant flares, which ones are coming from collapsed stars, and which ones are uh, compact binary mergers. So that is mission one, or objective one. Objective two would be to identify conditions necessary to launch a transient astrophysical jet. So what makes these GRBs actually go? And there's just a lot of different things that we can look into, the gen jet launch mechanisms, different uh, models for that, uh, central engine powering the jet. You know, we can observe that um, temporal and spectral properties and all of this. Um, mission, our objective three, determine the origin of the observed high energy emission within the relativistic flows. So again, I'll just find more and more information about these uh, gamma ray bursts and their properties. All right, let's get um, into the details of Moonbeam. So Moonbeam is a small sat spacecraft that's being developed by Lockheed Martin. We are going to reuse about 90% of um, a lunar trailblazer uh, design. So that is a mission that'll be going up here in I think a year or two, and it's going to look for water on the uh, moon. And so since we can actually use that, we'll have a high heritage and it just provides a lot of, of stability for our, uh, pro our project design. Um, also, since we're going to be up in cis lunar orbit, we need to get a ride share option to get out there. So um, especially with SLS and, and a lot of uh, missions going back out towards the moon, we're hoping to get um, on any sort of geosynchronous transfer orbit so they can kind of spit us out and allow us to get into the orbit we want to get to. Our orbit, which um, you can see down in the, the left is just kind of a general orbit that we're trying to get to. Um, we would be up to you know 460,000 kilometers from Earth. Well, our orbital period will be about 13.7 days. We hope to have a three-year mission lifetime. Um, and something that's proved quite tricky with being out at cis lunar orbit is how do we get our data down to the ground? So right now we've been in discussions to try and get um, daily data downlink with the near space network, but that is always evolving. So our mission capability, um, so like I said, we're gonna be out in cis lunar orbit. We hope to be from 22,000 kilometers to 460,000 kilometers from the earth. Um, and this really provides a great advantage. So the current missions in low Earth orbit, you can see here on the left is an example of Fermi GBM. Uh, we are blocked by the Earth. So about 30% of our sky is blocked by the Earth. And that can prove problematic whenever you're trying to observe gamma ray bursts because they happen all over the sky. So when we're out at cis lunar orbit, we will get instantaneous all sky field of view. 
And so only the Earth will occult only about 2% of the sky, and that's only at our closest approach. So on average, we'll have a less than 1% uh, occultation. Um, another issue with low Earth orbit is that they are constantly going through the South Atlantic anomaly, which is a region of high particle energy. And that causes a lot of them to turn off, so it does not damage our instruments. So down here in the right, we have um, kind of a plot of Burmese GBM and Burmese LAT and their SAA regions. And you also see a little point where, where GRB 17817A was. And so at that time, when we had our great binary neutron star merger that we've observed in gravitational waves and EM, we were two minutes away from going into South Atlantic anomaly. So that's GBM. And the Fermi lat was actually already turned off. And so they did not observe it. So we really don't want something like that to happen again. So going out to cis lunar orbit provides us not without a problem. We have a high duty cycle about 96% of the time. We are way past any of the South Atlantic anomaly situation. So we will not be turning off for that. And we also get a stable background compared to low Earth orbit. So there's no atmospheric scattering that happens, no other related uh, SAA radiation. And um, we also would be able to add to kind of the localization um, capabilities of low Earth orbit instruments. So there is a group called the um, Interplanetary Network, and they provide timing triangulation technique of multiple gamma ray missions to really you know, decrease the localization um, provided by the instruments. And with us being out at such a large baseline, we'll really be able to help the, the localization get smaller and smaller. So we can figure out where these GRBs are really coming from. Um, so just as a yes, um, show, we have the Moonbeam All Sky Instantaneous Coverage in the big purple plot. And that is at an effective area of 300 keV. And that's current with our current detector configuration. So a little bit more about the detectors then. We plan on having six scintillating detectors that are strategically positioned to give us that instantaneous all sky coverage. And these detectors are going to be two different materials, so, uh, sodium iodide and cesium iodide. And it's um, going to use a flat panel PMT. So this two material design, which is called a Boswich design, allows us to use pulse discrimination to determine which photons are actually coming from behind. So we can really rule out um, any photons coming from the back, know exactly where they're coming from, which will help with our localizations. Um, let's see. We also plan on having a wide energy range and wild, wide field of view for spectroscopy from 10 to 5,000 keV, and, um, which is in the prompt GRB peak energy range. So it'll be excellent for detecting GRBs. And up in the left, we have a picture of kind of our detector in the lab. And on the right, we have our single detector effective area, which is compared to GBM in the black dashed lines. And we have kind of the two different um, observing modes that we'll have with that Foswich detector. We'll have the, the blue is just rece receiving all of our photons. And then the yellow is ruling out those photons that are coming from behind. So we can make sure the photons we're observing are the ones we want to observe. Um, so more about our instrument capability. Here's a couple of plots looking at our <clears throat> detection fraction. On the left, we have our um, sensitivity for short GRBs, and we have the detection fraction on the y-axis, 64 millisecond photon flux on the x. And we have our six detector um, configuration in blue, which is our goal. Our four, our four detector configuration is in green, and that's kind of our, our last uh, resort. We really don't want to get dropped down to that, but um, going through the process of developing a, a uh, instrument takes some give and take from the, uh, the engineering department as well. So uh, in the orange, we have GBM detector fraction. So we can see that the, the six detectors is giving us quite a uh, difference in our detection fraction from GBM. On the right, we have our Cumulative fraction on the Y and our angular radius of one sigma containment, which is our localization on the X. And here we can see that, um, so the colors are all the same. And so here our six detectors are close to GBM's localization, but, but not quite, which um, is understandable since we are using six 
detectors rather than currently GBM has 12 detectors that it uses. So here is um, our team, mostly um, down in Huntsville, Alabama. Our PI is Michelle Hoy at Marshall Space Flight Center. And uh, we also have people from all over the country and are continue looking for more people to join our team. So please let us know if you're interested. Uh, quick summary, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all the things, but I did want to um, actually point out that we're looking also for future collaborations with Moonbeam. We are planning on collaborating with the LIGO Laboratory, uh, Ice Cube, IPN, the Cherenkov Telescope, and uh, Southern Whitefield Gamma Ray Observatory. But if you are on another collaboration and would like to work with us, we are always welcome. Uh, welcoming more people. And again, we just received our funding through the NASA Mission of Opportunity for our phase A study, and we're hoping to continue going forward with this, but we'll find out this summer. So thank you. Question? Yeah, um, so I have a comment on the technical side of things. I was kind of curious, the flat panel came to you or you're selecting to go to for uh, heritage reasons, or is there a reason you, you didn't want to go with like a, a silicon community? I know temperature variations are a problem, that sort of thing, but. Uh, yes, and I believe the PMTs are lighter and cheaper, uh, the flat, flat PMTs. Um, and since we're only planning on being up there for three years, the uh, kind of issues with their, um, so I believe flat PMTs have um, more issues with radiation after a few years, they start to degrade. But since our you know, mission lifetime is only three years, it was perfectly in there, um, in that range. So, so, but I'm not, I'm not a specific instrument in the PMT section. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, it's sort of the thing that people keep going to do, you know, it's Yeah. Much yes, yeah, um, yeah, because we are going to be in a small set, so it's it's not going to be as big as Fermi GM, GBM, which has the other style. So, I, I don't understand your orbit. I mean, you're you're crossing the orbit of the moon uh, at a time that was asynchronous with the lunar month, and so isn't that uh, chaotic? Um, we're going to be in a Lagrange orbit, so it's going to be pretty stable. But that is still up for, you know, our engineers have been working on trying to get that to be the most stable and uh, best orbit possible. Oh, so you're going to L1 or L3? Uh, I believe it's L, I think it's L1, and we're also, yeah, thinking about L3. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's thank the both speaker again. If you have further questions, Dr. Fletcher will be here today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs>